Governor Rick Snyder delivered his State of the State address this week, entering a re-election year. The governor's to-do list includes road and bridge funding, investing in job creation and education, raising eyebrows, a call for the federal government to get its fiscal house in order. We'll break it all down from both sides of the aisle on West Michigan Week. We were hired to do a job. I'm proud to report tonight, we're getting that job done. We are reinventing Michigan. Michigan is the comeback state. We've come farther and faster than most any other state in the economic recovery since the beginning of the Great Recession, and we should be proud of that. Helping us dissect the address, we have Zane McMillan, Grand Rapids Press. How are you? Great, how are you? Roger Moyles, Professor of Political Science at Grand Valley State University. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thanks, Peter. Patrick. Patrick. You're, you're, you're a lover, <laughs> Patrick. and you love freight trains. We know that. Yes. <laughs> Representative Robert oh, Hewlin, good. Republican from Walker, and Representative Brandon Dillon, Democrat from Grand Rapids. Nice to be here. Good to see you. Good to be here. Always a good time of the year. We get to look back, take a look into the future. Uh, overall, uh, the address for you, Rob, what did you make of it? Well, I thought it was very positive. The governor recited, uh, uh, measured some of the progress we've made, 221,000 uh, private sector jobs, uh, personal incomes up, uh, home starts are up. Uh, he talked about the investment uh, going forward. And so I thought it was a very upbeat message and a very positive one. And, and more importantly, I've had the chance uh, to two different occasions this morning to talk to folks that listened to it. And uh, the overall reaction was very, very positive and encouraging. So I thought it was a great address. Runs late. The weather wasn't all that great. You stayed overnight. Uh, you molded over a bit yourself. I did. I, and, and shockingly, I've come to a different conclusion than Rob. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was... Uh, you know, the governor's never going to get an A for style points and that, but I, I think the um, address was, um, it had some problems. And, and the first one is uh, this talk about unemployment. It, when the governor's own dashboard that he refers to, when he took office in uh, 2011, we were 48th in the country in unemployment. We were third worst. Today, we're 48th in the country in unemployment. We're third worst. And he calls that progress. Um, you know, the, I think the, the Michigan that the governor sees is very good if you're one of his corporate friends or you work in the Treasury Department and just got a 90% raise. But for middle class families across the state who've had their taxes uh, jacked up sky high and their education funding for, cut for their schools, they see a different Michigan than he sees. Well, let, let's hear it from the governor himself talking about jobs and talking about personal income. In the last three years, we've added 221,000 private sector jobs. Not only that, have we led the nation. We're number one in adding manufacturing jobs. And for the first time since 2006, our labor force is actually growing in the state of Michigan. That's something to be proud of. Let's talk about personal income. How has per capita income done in the state of Michigan? For the first three quarters of 2013, we were number one, tied with Wisconsin, for income growth in the Great Lakes states. We are number seven in the nation for growth in personal income. That's a whole lot better than being 50th, folks. And Zane, I know you've been following a lot of this. Yeah, yeah. I was curious. I know the unemployment rate hasn't budged very much recently. What have you two been hearing about that? I'm sure different things given your uh, districts, but is that a, still a, a problem for people? Are people still harping on that? Well, I, I'm not hearing people harping on it so much, but it obviously is a problem when anyone who wants to work can't find work. So I think uh, the creation of, of jobs, private sector jobs, is critically important for the state. Uh, I think in West Michigan, uh, employment picture is, is better. Uh, I've talked to, uh, in fact, my guest last night was uh, a small manufacturer, uh, DeWise uh, Manufacturing, the uh, small manufacturer of the year last year and, and uh, it's sort of uh, he's been expanding his employment base but but that just leads to another issue because one of the concerns that he has is, is occupational training because a lot of the he's having a challenge finding uh, young folks or employees that have the skill set needed which is another thing that I think we need to focus on going forward. Yeah, what have you been hearing? Well you know my district uh, you know, there's still I, I think the unemployment rate would be significantly higher there um, you know, I think it's important to go back and w let's uh, realize where those private sector jobs mainly have come from, and that's the auto industry. And that is an auto rescue package that this governor opposed, that the vast majority of Republicans in the legislature opposed. Those jobs would have never been created if Governor Snyder and others who thought that that was a bad investment in our state would have had their way. Those jobs, when the governor, the, the recession, uh, the recovery started in 2009. 
Um, the governor's trying to take credits for jobs he didn't create. I think the standard should be when his program was put into place, when he was able to get his tax changes enacted, when he was able to put his program and get approval from the Republicans in the legislature, the unemployment rate was 8.8%. Today it's 8.8%. Yeah, are things moving quickly enough for you? Do you think they're moving apace? Well, I think they're, I think they're moving in the right direction. Uh, again, I think until we have uh, uh, everyone who wants to work and uh, ability to, to find a job, I think uh, we're, we're not there. And the faster we can get there, the better. But I do think, uh, I, I would disagree with, with, with Brandon on the, uh, the, the statistics I saw that of these, these new, new jobs. Uh, less than 20 percent are auto related so I think uh, you know there have been other sectors of the economy uh, agriculture has been has been very positive uh, I come out of a retail background uh, retail uh, at least here in West Michigan Meyer was my my occupation before I came went to Lansing very positive very strong very uh, I come out of the city of Walker uh, I, I talked last week to the Walker folks, and, and Walker has an income tax, which is a pretty good measure of, of, of employment and overtime and so forth, and they're at the highest level they've ever been in the city of Walker. So, so I think to say that uh, things aren't on a positive uh, direction is just flat out wrong, because when you talk to people who, and, and again, with a, with a local background, a local government background, uh, City of Grand Rapids income tax revenues are up considerably. That reflects positive, positive growth in the in the employment sector. But but how much do we attribute that to the governor and his policies and reforms? Because we've seen that nationally too. Well, no, that's that's certainly true. Although although uh, we lead in the manufacturing uh, creation of, of new manufacturing expansion of manufacturing jobs in the Michigan in in uh, in the country. And, and I don't, I don't, uh, I wouldn't give the, the governor credit for every positive thing. Or I wouldn't give him blame for every negative thing. But really, the question in my mind is, are we going in the right direction? And there, I feel very positive when I talk to folks in West Michigan. I mean, this state has challenges. City of Detroit's a big challenge. We've got challenges with a number of our school districts. But the question is, are we moving in the right direction? And from where I come from, uh, I had, I had a journalist ask me last night. He said, "Well, Rob, I used to interview you when you were the mayor of Walker." And you were never so upbeat and positive. And I said, well, think about it. Those were, in, those were the days when local government uh, uh, revenue sharing was being slashed every year by Lansing. Uh, we had to close City Hall because we just didn't have the revenues. And so, so I said, when I see positive direction, positive uh, uh, growth, I'm, I'm upbeat. I'm upbeat on Michigan. I'm upbeat on Michigan residents. And so I wouldn't give the governor all of the credit, but I certainly, uh, I certainly think his programs are, are moving us in the right direction, and I think that's good news for Michigan. It's interesting you, you mentioned that. It, it, being a mayor at one time and now being in the state legislature, did I miss it last night? I didn't really hear anything about revenue sharing. Uh, no, I, I didn't hear anything about revenue sharing, although I know the budget in the current year, there is an increase in revenue sharing. And uh, so that's, that's a positive from local government. And, and, and again, I, I have probably eight or nine different local units of government, and I, I talk to them constantly, and they're all, they're all feeling pretty upbeat, pretty positive. And th there was mention of the surplus. Uh, what, what are the current numbers on the surplus? I believe it's, um, th there's anticipated, and I think people need to recognize this is, it, there, it's not money that we have, it's money that's anticipated. A um, billion dollars over three years is, essentially yeah. what it is. From um, where the state was to from now, where, that's Well, it's, it's, that's it's, it's revenues that we expect to gain more rather than what we thought we were going to have at the last revenue estimating conference. Certainly positive, but I would, I would note two things. Revenue sharing actually was eliminated, um, as we know it, in the governor's first budget. Massive cuts. Anything, I think it's a little bit disingenuous to say we've gotten an increase in revenue sharing since then when it was cut so dramatically. It's nowhere near it was at the level when the governor took office. That's, that's true. And I think a lot of the, uh, the statistics that the governor points to about we're investing more here and we're investing more there, compared to where it was before he took office, it's not close. Um, in terms of, um, you know, some of, the, some of the other things the governor's um, talked about, you know, I, look, I think Rob has... Is, is right. Things aren't as bad as they were, but the point you made, Roger, is, you know, we've had a national recovery that has recovered faster than the state of Michigan. And the governor, if he's going to try to take credit for things, needs to be accountable for the things he's done in office. And I will tell you this, the middle class in this state, and if you're a senior on a, collecting retirement income and having to pay the pension tax for the first time, this, they're not as upbeat about their future as I think some others might um, try to make it if you listen to the governor. Uh, 
being anticipated that that amount what do you what do you do with it i've heard a lot of i think a lot of knee jerk was roads put it into roads but we also didn't hear much about that last night well i, I mean from my perspective i think it's fairly simple you know the, the the governor made deep and devastating cuts, and Republicans in the legislature, before Rob got there, in fairness, um, deep and devastating cuts to education. They enacted a pension tax. This was all done to pay for a nearly $2 billion corporate tax cut. If you go back and look at the time, the governor did not dispute that he did this. In fact, they said it was necessary to be able to change our, our business tax code. And, um, you know, we are getting more revenues for a couple reasons. One, we've raised taxes on people. Two, we've slashed funding for education. And three, you have people that are anticipated not collecting MBT credits that they thought they would when the budget was first put together. We still have a hole in the budget for Medicaid expansion when we didn't put immediate effect on that, for not fixing the claims tax issue, which funds some of our local hospitals and helps draw Medicaid revenue down. So I would personally like to see the pension tax eliminated. I think that's the first place we should start. And second, let's actually reinvest in education rather than throwing around you know, this kind of mathematical gymnastics on, on the amount of money that the governor says he's spending and what people at home actually know is being done. Well, I, I have to respond to that. I'm completing my, my first year, and, and, and I'll tell you, we, we increased the K-12 spending and, uh, by 3.4 percent, over $400 million in the, in the current year budget. Uh, we added uh, early childhood uh, education, which is critical, and that's going to continue. Uh, we increased uh, spending on higher education by 2.2 percent. So, so when you look back on a lot of these programs, I think, I think, uh, uh, I think we're, we're making those investments and talking about seniors. I was uh, with the senior advocates out of the Frederick Meyer Gardens this morning. I was asking them, what do you think? And, 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 and of course, they, the, the, the pension tax is an issue for them. But, but I heard more positive comments on, on Meals for Wheels, or Wheels for Meals, which, which the governor uh, plugged. I mean, we, we made a, a concentrated effort last In year. In-home services, that type of that's thing. That's exactly yeah. right, because I think quality of life for our seniors, if a senior is able to live in his or her own home and we can bring those meals, that's, a, that's an incredible, uh, a incredible benefit for the seniors. And it's a cost savings because the alternative is some kind of an institutional care which is higher cost. So, so I, again, I can't speak for the entire last three years, but I can certainly say when we did the budget for the current year, and, and I'm optimistic as we go forward, we're going to address those things, and I think the governor identified them last night. So, so uh, and, and, and as far as the overall, I mean, it, it, it's kind of a, maybe a silly uh, statistic, but, but uh, he quoted uh, uh, United Van Line, folks leaving Michigan as opposed to that, <coughs> that flow out is stopping and, and uh, has stopped and, and we're actually increasing population. So to, to suggest that we're in the wrong, going the wrong direction, I, th I think is just wrong. And, and, and I think, y you know, Brandon and I are politicians and we, 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 we make these kind of arguments, but when you talk to real people, I think there's no question that there's a sense that we're on the right path and things are improving. Could I uh, ask you about the K-12 funding? Because the governor, in, a, in what was really a positively toned speech, I mean, he was reaching out, doing his shout outs to everybody, but that was the one point when I think he was talking, he had to clarify because of his position on we how much money clip. went. We have the clip if you want to see it. Now I think that'd be great. It. Let's, let's uh, hear from the governor. I firmly believe in investing in K-12 education. And I'm proud to say in the last three years, we've increased educational spending at the state level for K-12 each and every year to the point where we've invested $660 more per student than there was previously before I took office. That's a huge investment in K-12 education. Now you'll find people occasionally talking, well, it didn't show up in the per dollar allowance. Let me clarify the record on that. Those dollars have been invested in K-12. About half of the dollars, over a billion dollars, has gone into the school employee pension plan. And why did it happen that way? Because I think it's critically important we stand up and we properly fund our pension plans to make sure those 440,000 school employees and retirees can count on a solid pension. And at the same time, it allows school districts to put dollars in the classrooms instead of pension plans. It's the right answer, and we need to keep it up. And, and, I'll, and I'll respond to the question. I, and and I, think, I think it's actually true. I mean, I've looked at the numbers. What he says is true. Now, now what the legislature did and the governor is that instead of giving dollars, they're investing in the pension plans to keep those solvent and funded, 
Well, it's, it's, it's six of one, half a dozen another, in, in, in a sense, because you're, you're making sure that those, those are funded, but otherwise that would be a responsibility of the local school district. And I've talked to my superintendents and they said, yeah, that's true. We would rather have the money and then make the investment. But th the reality is we've had some school districts, and I'm a, I'm a local control kind of person. I don't like Lansing telling school districts how to operate. I don't like Lansing telling local units of government, but we've certainly had evidence of school districts that have been fiscally irresponsible, and it's critically important that those school employees, that their pensions are funded. And so I think, I think there have been investments in K-12, and, and, uh, and, and I think they're going to continue. And the practice of, of prepaying, uh, you know, paying the, the pension obligations, uh, when you talk to the superintendents, I don't hear a big objection. Well, let, let me, um, obviously, I, I think what the governor said is, is disingenuous at best. I mean, I think he should have actually been charged for a political advertisement last night. That was certainly a thinly veiled attempt to, to put a campaign speech in the middle of a state of the state address. In 2007, the foundation allowance for schools was $7,085 per pupil. In 2009 through 2011, before the governor took office, it went up to $7,316. The first year of the governor's budget, 6,846. Today, it's at 7,076. That's less than it was in 2007. Certainly, there has been some reform done to try to reduce the costs of school districts, but it in no way makes up even close for the amount of money that was cut out of school budgets. And if the governor really believes that he's put $660 per pupil in the classroom since he's been uh, governor, I, I would like to invite him to come to Grand Rapids and sit with a group of parents and teachers and students and tell them that they have more money in their school district than they did when he took office. It's not true. They cut the categoricals, they cut uh, the foundation allowance, they made the largest cut in education funding in the history of the state when he took office. And if you go back and look at the news clips, the governor said, we have to cut this year. And why did they have to cut? Because they had to find revenue to be able to fill the hole left by a $2 billion tax cut. To date, you cannot identify one job that is directly attributable to that. I think that is, is the worst investment we can make. And it's even worse when the governor gets up and tries to insult the intelligence of the people of Michigan by telling them that something that they know in their heart is true, that their schools are not seeing revenues and investment in them, is not true. I, it, was, it was astounding. Um, it was brazen. I'll give him credits for that, but it's not true. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the rebuttal. <laughs> We're talking about political campaigns. Uh, no, I, I, think, I think the numbers are there. I think the, 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 what he said is factually correct. And I think it, uh, you know, there was a period years ago when there were federal funds, the, and that was used into the, into the foundation allowance. And when those monies weren't there anymore, there was a, a, a corresponding reduction. But the reality is, let's just take the last 12 months, the current budget year, 3.4% increase in, in K-12 education. Now, now, Brandon can't take issue with that. Well, I certainly can, because the, 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 my district you're that I represent... You're saying that we're not, we didn't, we're not spending 3.4% more on K-12 education in the current budget than we did last year's budget? I'm saying that the governor's entire record, the three years he's been but, office... Uh, but, but that's not the that's question. The I'm saying... Are we or are we not? And I don't mean to cross-examine. No, that's you. all right. We we are we we increased spending on K-12 education by 3.4 percent in the current year over last year. Correct? No. And I will tell you why. If you go and well, I will talk about my district in Grand Rapids. Well, no, let's talk about statewide. It's an eleven dollar per pupil increase this year, and that was uh, credited by the governor as being some massive investment in education. The the federal funds you talk about, Rob, accounted for about a hundred dollars per pupil that we lost. That doesn't make up for the other $385 per pupil that the governor cut in 2011. Now there have been some increases since then. We have not continued to have negative investment after that. But it's the 3.4 percent you talk about does not even come close to making up for the hole that they were put in when the governor first came into office. And I will remind people that the reason the governor cut education and continues to transfer out $400 million in the school aid fund to prop up uh, general fund losses that used to fund higher education was to finance a tax cut for corporations. There is no dispute about that. Well, I, at least we've agreed that we have increased our investment in K-12 education. But, but Rob, you said we increased it, higher education spending by 2.2 percent. That's, That's true. That's accurate. But the year prior to that, we cut it by 15 percent. So overall, know, it's a 13 percent cut. If you look at the facts, 
if you go back 20 years, 20 years ago, we were, we were, we have 15 public universities. We were uh, probably 80% of their funding was through state appropriations. Today, depending on the university, it's, it's under 20. That has been a steady decline. It isn't, it's not this governor, it isn't the past governor, it's been the last half a dozen governors, it's been a steady de decline, and it was, and it was sloping down. Uh, this governor and this legislature reversed that, that slope, not, not as much as our 15 public universities would like to see, but the reality is we are investing more in higher education. And, 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 and the problem with, that, with those slopes is as you, look at, as you look at the funding from Lansing come down, you're seeing the tuition go up and that results in the, the huge debt load that our students are. Uh, so it's an, important, it's an important issue for our state. And, and again, I'm very <coughs> upbeat and positive that we've, we've kind of reversed that trend. It's, it's, not, it's not to the level that Grand Valley State would like or Michigan State or Wayne State, but, but it's a reversal of a trend that, that had continued up until this governor took office. And now it's reversing. Could, could I ask again about the, uh, the, the uh, surplus that the governor mentioned? He mentioned it quite late in the speech, too. He had set the stage for it. And, then, uh, and we know this governor doesn't like to talk a lot of details in the state of the state address. When the budget comes out, that's when he really starts talking about specifics. But um, do, do you have any sense? He mentioned about tax relief, uh, and that's not a tax cut. And there was some kind of a warning on that to not expect too much there. Um, in what direction do we think that's going to go? He had talked about some programs that would be expansive, like er early education programs right. and things like that. Um, but uh, do you have any sense of where that tax relief would go? He talked about hardworking Americans who take their lunch to work. Yeah. Or uh, uh, Michiganders. Well, yeah. I, well, and I think at least uh, uh, this legislator and this person who's on the Appropriations Committee would be a little concerned of a permanent tax cut without knowing, uh, you, you know, we have, we have a surplus projected for the current year and going forward a bit. But if you make a permanent tax cut, uh, we still have a number of, a number of very important things to, to address. I think, if I had to predict, I haven't talked to the governor, I don't know what his, what his thinking is. Just from what he said, it sounded like it would be some kind of a, for a, a low, moderate income level folks. But it, but it can't be, it, it can't be a, a significant, significant. I mean, it's a lot of money. But when you divide it by the number of folks working in this state, it's, it's not a great deal. And, and you can't, I don't know how you can responsibly promise permanent tax relief. So, so I, I, don't, I don't know what he, we're going to find out in a couple of weeks when he makes his budget presentation. But I'd like to see him. Uh, the the HICA tax hole is $120 million. Uh, we want to continue to invest in, in K-12, the early, uh, early childhood. I'd like to continue to uh, uh, provide relief for the, for the universities in the state. Uh, and, and we haven't and the governor, too, did not mention roads very much. But, but a year ago, he was talking about $1.2 billion just to maintain. Um, Do I heard we have roads in Michigan anymore? And again, I, I, I come out of local government, and, and so every time I visit a, a township board, a uh, city council, what are you going to do about roads? And it's a big problem. And, and uh, even if you assume we have a billion dollars this year to appropriate, that's that's less than what, we, what the experts tell us we need to maintain what we currently have. And if it's a one-time surplus, uh, that means what are you going to do next year? So it's, it's a big problem that we, uh, and I'm hoping we can find a bipartisan Absolutely. solution on how we fund roads and bridges, airports, harbors in Michigan over the long haul. And I don't think it's a Republican or a Democrat issue. I think it's one that we as a as a state have to get our arms around and find a formula. The, the current formula, uh, and, and it's a good thing that people aren't using you know, the, the electric cars and the hybrids and public transit. Those are all positive things, but what that means is you have less gallons of gas sold and that's how we, that's how we fund our roads. Well, you're, you're talking about energy and as uh, I was talking about a comprehensive energy policy, we went from that into talking about a, a balanced budget amendment and here's the governor. But I am making a request here tonight because it involves you, the legislators, both the House and the Senate, that I ask you to take up the issue of doing a resolution asking the United States government to include in the United States Constitution an amendment to say they have to balance their budget. 
election year politics with that? Well, look, it's a, a tried and true um, applause line to, to call for the balanced budget amendment. I think the most Democrats would agree that that's something that the federal government should do. I don't know how it's relevant for what we need to do in Michigan here right now in the next year or the next few years, but you know, if, the, if, if that's a priority for the legislature this year, I don't think you're going to get a lot of Democrats who don't think the federal government should balance their budget, but it's, it, it, it's something that would have to um, happen over uh, qu quite a few years because we do rely on significant federal funding for our, for our Michigan budget. It plays well with the party because the governor has done just that. He's balanced the budget. Well, and, and we all do that. Uh, local government has to balance its budget. State government has to balance its budget. We all in our family life have to balance our budget. And I think, I think long term, and maybe not so long term, I think the, the federal government's inability or unwillingness to balance its budget is creating long term uh, problems for our, for our entire country because you can't sustain this forever, and I think uh, we need to do it for our children and grandchildren. All right. We look forward to next year. We look forward to the proposed budget coming up in the next few months. Zane McMillan, Grand Rapids Business Journal. Thanks, Thanks for Patrick. stopping by. Roger Moyle, you are a professor of political science at Grand Valley State University, Representative Verhulen, Representative Dillon. Thank you both thank you. so much. Thank you. Good to be here. And thank you for joining us this week. We'll see you next week on West Michigan Week.